What's up guys? Sam Lipman Stern here on the Fly Out of Line podcast. Got the ill ass hosts, Joseph and Carrie. You know these motherfuckers, we out here. I'm just a friend. Joe gave me a call the other day, asked if, if I wanted to be on the show and said he had an, uh, a story to tell me and some information that he wanted to reveal to me. And he, wouldn't, he didn't want to tell me on the phone. He'd like to tell me in person. And I was intrigued by it. So here I am ready to, to take in this information. I have no idea what we're about to talk about, but Joe said it was super important and interesting information. He wanted to tell me a story. So here I am. Thank you for having me. All right. <laughs> Welcome. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for the intro. That, that helps. <laughs> so uh, so we, we did our first attempt at having a podcast uh, back in October, and we had on, you know, Sam Lippman Stern, Mr. Green, uh, and your boy, Vyacheslav Young Diamond Rabinovich. Yeah, yeah, we had them on, and we were just sort of bumbling around trying to figure out how to make a podcast. We're all high as fuck, so that didn't help. We're trying to figure out something like that. Yeah, I thought the, the being high was a good motivator to be different. Uh, but you know, at that time, we I think that we felt like we wanted to make something to say something, uh, but we found the pro the technical process to be a bit difficult and slow. Uh, but since that time, you know, is less than a year ago, uh, a lot has sort of happened in our lives, and I think that the result of things that have just happened now, even within the past four months, it made me want to not give up on the, the podcast process and maybe, you know, step back in and record, you know, on, on, you know, online on this thing, you know, basically what's happened. Cool. Right? Yeah. You think that's a good idea? I mean, we're doing it, so. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So as, as I said to you, uh, I'm 39 years old and, you know, you're 31, you're 41. Mm. To me, the second, be the second half of your 30s is kind of uneventful numerically. You know, it's not like when I'm like 19, I'm like, oh shit, I'm 19. What's going to happen at 20? You know, like it's it like each number becomes this, you know, uh, the, this this numerical uh, uh, identity, yeah, and you know exactly how old you are at twenty four years old, at twenty five years old. But when you get into the second half of your thirties, it just it's just very forgettable. Like sometimes I forget how f I'd be like thirty seven, and I'd forget exactly which one I am, and start calculating back to nineteen seventy nine, trying to figure out how old I was. Yeah. So turning thirty nine, you would think ah, it's just a whatever number. You, you dismiss the number and it's like, oh, it's all about 40. You're like, oh, 40, yeah. I'm probably going to get a surprise party on my 40th birthday. Oh, I wonder what it, where I'm going to be at 40. Oh, 40 is over the hill. 40 is this, 40 is that. 40 is a, is a, is a numerical number for change, not 39. So yeah, yeah. After, after we recorded that podcast, uh, I started to try you know i i became really interested in doing psychedelics and stuff like that and it was always like to complement like a like a fun time or being out of the box being a bit silly this and that but then i found that in doing things like mushrooms or acid uh the more i would do Sometimes I kept having this knee-jerk reaction to just withdraw to the corner and maybe just go lay and have this really intense experience. And it wasn't until I became comfortable incorporating psychedelics uh, while painting alone in the studio that I really understood the benefits of doing psychedelics maybe in, in, in less of a social way. Mm, interesting, yeah. And... Uh, 
you know, one year ago this month, uh, we first did DMT where it worked and DMT dimethyltryptamine. And that first session that we did where it actually worked, we did all this preparation and took it super serious, like zend out uh, the creative space, lit candles, meditated, used a singing bowl, all this kind of stuff, ate really clean, didn't drink alcohol or do anything for a while before. And the experience worked. We tapped into something, we went a bit f further with it, but it was just always in my mind all those months following that one year ago. And I was like, I really want to do DMT again, but I found the smoking process to be really annoying because sometimes I smoke weed. I don't get high off of weed. Yeah. Uh, so everything changed New Year's of this year for me. I, I had a cold and I was at my friend, my friend Trace's house and he had, was having a party and I was just there sipping on a tea in a thermos at this party. And I had already made a decision that I didn't want to drink anymore. I never had an alcohol problem or anything. I just, after get taking these experiences more seriously and stuff like that, I made a decision that I, I didn't see alcohol as being a part of my life. Cool. I, I, I wanted, if I was going to indulge in something, I wanted it to be something where I was able to gain an insight or go into myself and maybe work with something. I found that alcohol just sort of numbed me, so I decided to not drink anymore. So I'm at a New Year's party and fucking everyone's there all drunk and being silly or whatever. And I'm just there kind of sick, drinking on a tea, trying to get better. And then I was talking to this dude, this dude, Mike, and he was started talking to me about DMT. He's like, yeah, I heard you did it. And I said, yeah, I did it back in August. But I said, I really want to do it again. I found out that if you did it with a vaporizer, you know, a volcano vaporizer, that uh, it is more potent and that's the best way to do DMT. And then I was like, oh, well, you know, and, and I wanted to try it, but I didn't have a, a vaporizer. Yeah. I thought that maybe if I do it this way, it'll be easier than smoking it. Because to smoke it, you can't put the flame directly on it. And it's all this trickery with being a smoker that I'm just fucking terrible at it. Yeah. I can't do it. So I was telling this dude, I'm like, yeah, I want to do it again. You know, and he's telling me about how he's interested in it. And I said, I want to get a vaporizer. He said, oh, my boy has a vaporizer. And I said, okay, well, do you think you could get it? And he's like, yeah, I, I could ask him for it. I said, well, look, if you can get the vaporizer and you're serious, come see me and I'll bring the DMT and we can do it. But in order to do it, we have to prepare and do it all this other way. Because the first time I did DMT, it didn't work because mm. I didn't prepare. I treated it like a party drug. I treated it like a drug. I don't, mm, I don't even yeah. feel like it's a drug at all. It's something else. You, 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 you get out of it what you put into it. Mm. You have to be able to tune into it. So he was pretty serious. He showed up to my house uh, a week later. And it was a day that we were shooting a podcast, one of these lost episodes of podcasts that haven't <laughs> come out because of fucking Ben Buttons disappeared. He disappeared to Africa, I think, or something. I don't know. Uh, we have unaired episodes. We were gonna shoot a podcast episode after Mike and I were gonna do DMT. So we showed up, he brought the vaporizer in, we set it up, uh, and I took two hits into it. One deep breath in, held it, slowly exhaled. The next time I'm breathing oxygen in is my second hit, deep, hit in and by that second hit, I could see a room in the corner of my eye, like a warmly lit room in the corner of my eye. I take that second hit and then I'm like, I'm like, well, I gotta do a third hit. And I did the third hit and held it in, handed off the bag, was over trying to tune in, put a beanie over my eyes. Even though I was already seeing this room, yeah. I thought I still needed to put it over my eyes and I laid on the couch and just getting myself comfortable while at the same time going to a room. And I was laying down and immediately I got, left my body and went towards this room, this warmly lit room. 
And I started to come in from the, from the top corner of this room upon uh, an Egyptian statue. It, it looked like I was in like a chamber or something, or like in a pyramid or in a, a, a tomb or something like that. And it was this Egyptian statue made of gold. It was a female, a queen. It wasn't, it wasn't male, it was a female. It looked kind of like King Tut, you know, the sarcophagus of King yeah, Tut, yeah. how it's made of gold and like ornate with like blue, like jewels and shit in there and stuff yeah. like that. And she was seated, she was seated and facing forward like this. And I come up, I come up upon her face and I'm just sort of coasting down the side of this statue. And then I see uh, that there's a child sitting on her lap, on, on her left leg on her lap. And he's seated on the lap and facing forward as well. And he has, he's made of gold and he has like an ornate headdress, kind of like an Egyptian headdress on. And he's seated facing forward. And then I go and I sort of hover past him and hover down towards the feet. And then I feel as if I'm laying down, looking up at this statue. And then this statue, it starts to tilt back. And it starts to go into a lying position as if we're like two kids, you know, head to foot, laying head to foot in the bed. Whoa. It's laying down that. And I'm like, wait, is this a statue or is it a real person? And then I was told, like I hear, hear this telepathical uh, uh, advice to let go, let yeah. go. Like I was questioning and it was telling me to let go. So I began to let go and sink down with this statue into this room. I felt a sinking sensation. And I started to sink down with it. And I started to look across at the statue and the statue started to emanate this like beam of light started to come from this statue. Wow. And yeah. from this statue was a female figure made of light, kind of like how they depict angels or, you know, Patrick Swayze and Ghost yeah, yeah. when he's like gonna go to heaven because he killed Willie Lopez or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like how he turned into light. It was something like that, but it was a female and she had like a like a like a head covering and it reminded me from being forced to go to church and shit like that as a kid uh she looked like the virgin mary i was like the virgin mary and then she lifted her hands up and went like she went Shh. and then she put her her arms out and i started to relax and she grabbed me put me over into the corner started to nurture me and started to get me to let go and relax she began drawing a, a, a comparison between uh, meditation and sleep. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go to sleep, you know? And she's like, no, you're not going to go to sleep, you know? And she's just basically trying to get me to reduce down all of the pondering and anxieties or questioning or whatever and to get into this state of being present in the experience. Wow. That's a and to... And to continue along, she began to show me this really intense vision that had to do with politics and capitalism and the state of this world as you would sort of suss it out by looking at the news or looking at the, you know, the state of countries and cities around you and all this kind of stuff. She started to show me all this. And within it, there were certain things that I didn't understand what they were. Some of it I did, and it's like in full color. It's like in full color where there's some of it looks like you're looking as if I'm looking at you, like I'm looking at something in real life. Some yeah. of it appears to be like computer generated or something like that, made of light itself. Or some of it looks, you know, like, uh, like, like computer or cartoon depictions all within like a clustered montage, like how these paintings kind of exist in clusters. Mm. There's this, all of this animated imagery that is silently moving through something. And the way we read it is by saying, oh, well, what does this you know, Indian figure have to do with this thing from Egypt? Oh, well, it must be this. Or what does this thing have to do with that thing? Uh, the same way you read hieroglyphs. You, know, you take a picture of a bird and then you take a man holding you know, a staff uh, with the head of, a, of an eagle or something like that. And you say, oh, well, this and this means this. Yeah. You know, uh, you're seeing this animated in, in a montage. Show me the corner of a dollar bill. The corner of the dollar bill. Then she showed me the back of a dollar bill. And it was like a pyramid with an eye. 
And I said, oh, this is kind of corny. It kind of reminded me of this Taco Bell commercial, Luminati Taco Bell commercial. I don't think I've seen it. It was when before. you were in South America. <laughs> but I was like, oh, that, you know, like, like, oh, you know, like all these memes about like, oh, all these hidden meetings on the on the yeah. currency and stuff. So I was like, oh, that's kind of corny. I don't want to, I don't want to tell that to anyone. They're going to think I'm crazy. But it showed me the corner of the dollar bill, showed me the back of the dollar bill with a, uh, the, the, pyramid and the eye and all that. And then it showed me these two uh, heads with LCD screen flags scrolling down their faces, the skin of their faces, and they're yapping and overlapping and arguing with each other in this conflict of other stuff happening. And there are things that look like like, like geometry or mathematics. Uh, there was like uh, things associated with like politics and and war and conflict and all this stuff all going into each other. But then in it were these other things that didn't make any sense. There was like some cube that came out, like a dark colored cube that came out and opened up wow. in the middle of it. And I was like, what the fuck does that have to yeah. do with anything? And then, uh, and then I seen like all these other things that look like other types of religions. I seen this like Indian goddess that came out and she had like six arms. She had three arms on each side and she had like a human face. She was very attractive. Interesting. And she came out and opened up her arms like this and in between this thing associated with capitalism and all that. Wow. And I was just like overwhelmed with all of this stuff montaging together. And, and this then, is your first time doing DNC. This is the yeah. first time I broke into something. Wow. And I thought that, I thought that, whoa, this is a breakthrough. But I'm in it. And while I'm still in this first one, shows me all this stuff and I was still like overwhelmed by all this. She said, I need you to come back to me later when you don't have anything in front of you. Because I knew that I was on a time crunch because I had to come here and shoot a podcast. Wow, okay. So my, it was, my energy was on being technical and, and on time. She told me, I need you to come back when you don't have, this is the, the, this depiction of the statue and then this thing that she looked like the Virgin Mary, you know, and I was like, what the fuck does the Virgin Mary have to do with a fucking Egyptian statue yeah, or yeah. whatever? I'm like, I don't fucking yeah. know. But she's telling me and I feel this overwhelming sense of like a, a motherly presence, like love, yeah. like, like care, like, she, like I felt very safe. I wasn't scared by her. Uh, she told me I needed to come back later when I didn't have anything in front of me. She said I needed to bring this guy, Mike, the guy who brought the volcano. Uh, and that I needed to, she said I needed to buy a, vo a vaporizer. She said I needed to buy my own okay. instead of borrowing homeboys. Yeah. She said I needed to borrow, buy one. And I was like, <laughs> it's like, that's kind of fucking weird to connect to this depiction yeah. of Virgin Mary telling you to go buy a vaporizer. Yeah. And then she said... Shout out to Virgin Mary. <laughs> yes, shout out to Virgin Mary. So she said, go buy a vaporizer. And she said, uh, and tell what, tell Gano what happened here. That wow. guy Gano, the one yeah. that I had here on the yeah. podcast. She said, tell Gano what happened here. And then she threw me out of this experience. And it went from being in it to being right back to the living room, super sober, just like, whoa. And like, you know, quietly was just like, overwhelmed at what I just experienced Damn, like oh wow. shit and they both came, uh my girlfriend Victoria and Mike came out of theirs and ironically both of theirs were very Egyptian rooted as well which I've heard I had, that from other but other stories too which is super interesting. this was the first time that it was ever like just straight up like something like that for me so we all talked about our experiences and then we came down here and we shot a podcast episode and me and Mike were just sort of still blown away by what we saw. And I knew the objective was to go back. And after the podcast episode, uh, I decided we, we snuck off, went back and did it again. And when we did it again, I immediately went back to her again. I only seen her this one evening, two different times with about like a four hour difference i went right back to her and she was in this let me get let me get that drink yeah, yeah. she was in this dark space oh, fuck with it, yeah. <clears throat> yeah she was in this dark space 
And there were all these like light things that were animating. They looked like kind of like pillars that were like bowed out on the tops and the bottom. And they were made of like a full spectrum color that was moving, like rotating. And they were like yellows, greens, like, like ultraviolet. I don't know, like, like everything. And it was a whole space of a whole bunch of these things. And she was there. And I went to her and she carried me off into a corner again and started to sort of mother, like a mother, like sort of caress and nurture me and get me into a calm state. And then she started to show me things. Wow. That's so and cool. Holy shit. it was just like a whole bunch of information. I felt like she was like teaching me how to be able to maneuver in this. And then also I, I, I call it, I call it that later, like downloading me with something, you know, showing me something. And she started to tell me to do certain things or tell me to, to reach out to someone or show me depictions of people or do this, that, or whatever. And at that point I was just like, whoa, I was just blown away. And this dude, Mike was the same way, just blown away by all this. And we would talk about it when we come out of it. But at this point, you know, at this point in my life, I wrote off, I wrote off uh, being like, like religious as being like a, like a scam. Yeah, sure. I, I associated being spiritual with being religious. So I said, ah, I'm not, I'm not spiritual. I'm not believing this. I believe in nothing i believe yeah, yeah, yeah. in i believe in science i believe in whatever science says or mm -hmm. whatever uh there 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 is a physical explanation to all of this it's not just fucking these beings in the sky with fucking wings why would these beings have fucking wings you know like an angel or something like that why yeah. do they have fucking wings you know uh i just thought it was just like mythology but then as I started to get older and do start doing work on myself and all that kind of stuff, I started to just be a little bit more open to some of these things that I'm closed off to. So at this point, I just had this experience and I didn't quite know what to make of it. I said, is this just a hallucination or is it something else? Is it just my mind running off with itself yeah. and it's just like the accumulation of things that I've gathered or is it something else? And the next day, uh, I was in the house and Victoria put on some, like, Apple TV to, she Apple TV'd some documentary on sacred geometry and put it up on the TV and she was making breakfast. And I started watching, I was sitting on the coffee table watching this thing. And then there was this whole subject that came up of uh, this energy field called Taurus. Mm. So the way that energy moves through this planet whatever this surface of the world is, I don't know if it's flat around or what, I don't know what the fuck it is, but the way energy moves through it, it moves in this energy field, this recycling energy field of the shape of Taurus. And something about our chakras and all this kind of stuff in the energy field around us, it moves in the shape of Taurus and how the shape of Taurus can be seen in many living things on this planet and how it's rooted into the you know, the structure of this universe. What, what, the shape of Taurus, what's the like actual shape? Is it It looks like, there? you see that column up there? Yeah. It'd be like if the column had the same thing on the bottom. Oh, think of like an eaten apple. Okay. And the, sh the energy moves around it. Got and it. it started getting into how this thing is at the, f at the foundation of all of these things we accept in this known world. Interesting, wow. And I went the previous night and met this entity or hallucination or whatever in a space of nothing but these things. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, <laughs> I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. I didn't know about that. I didn't know about that shit. I said, wait a second. And then we started looking There's no way it, your brain no, could have just hallucinated no, this idea. I, no. It was information that No, you it's not. Into. Doing DMT is not a hazy dream. It's not staring at the wall and it breathing and moving, it's much more than that, Yeah, you know? And it's, you recollect things. You can be overloaded and just not be able to assign words to, you know, a deep response that you've had, Yeah, but it's there and, and it's present in you and take, can take a while to digest. So- It's very clear. 
Like it doesn't look like the way a dream would look or the way when you get high and things are kind of fuzzy. It's yeah. like very like HD 4K. Wow. Yeah. So That's amazing. So I was blown away from watching this documentary about how they started talking about sacred geometry and they started talking about how some of these things are rooted in us and all this stuff and energy. And they started to talk about these, you know, uh, uh, religious practices that are centered around meditation and how people are able to unlock aspects of themselves and their energy fields and tune into it. And they were showing like some cultures like Buddhist cultures and stuff and showing like some of these other like monks and whatnot and the art they make in the art that they're making, it looks like the stuff that you're tuning into and seeing in your wow. experience with DMT. Yeah. And it's like, well, they must be unlocked. All this stuff must be connected. So then I, I was just so thrown off by all of this stuff that I saw yesterday. And then just seeing this documentary the very fucking next day. So then I came back here to the studio and I started just, just thinking about it some more. And I'm like, is this all just some shit in my head or is it something else? So I said, you know what? I know this guy Gano might think I'm a little fucking crazy or whatever, but I'm going to call him. That guy's connected to some really deep shit. So maybe he won't think anything of it. Yeah. I ended up calling him. I talked to him. He was at LAX. He was on his way from doing a seminar out there or whatever and coming here. I said, hey, look, man, you know, it might sound a little crazy, but I had this experience. You know, I did DMT and I met this, this mother of this universe and she told me that I needed to tell you what happened. And he said, okay, you know, let's hear it. And I said, I went to this room. There was an Egyptian statue made of gold. It was a mother. On her lap was, you know, this child. He was made of gold as well. And I started to come in and start to lay with him. He said, all right, I'm going to stop you right there. He said, do you have a computer? I said, yeah, I got a computer. He said, can you go on, you know, go online, do a, do a search? He says, I want you to look up the name of Set. And, and I did. I looked up this name, a set, he said, you know, A-S-E-T. And he said, you know, in Kemet, in Kemet, they called her a set, but the Greeks called her Isis. I-S-I-S. -I, -S. Mm. I said, okay, I typed in Isis. I typed in a set. I typed in a set and like goddess or something like that. And, or a set in Egypt. Okay. Or, or Kemet. And the first image that came up in the Google search was a fucking statue of Isis seated on a throne, facing forward with her child who looked to be three or four years old Whoa. on the left leg. Holy shit, that's fucking Sitting crazy. there. And, and this is the continued, like a lot of the statues that there was this cult of Isis where they would depict, you know, Isis as a virgin mother. Hmm. And this is something you've never seen before. I never, I, I've, my, my ex-girlfriend had a boy pit bull that she named Isis. Hmm. And I said, oh, isn't that a girl's name? Because there was some other girl that wrote Isis once in New Jersey. Mm. And she says, oh, it doesn't matter. I, I wanted to name him Isis. I said, okay. So wow. I've seen Holy things, shit. you know, I've seen things out there, but not like this. Yeah. So there this image is, and it's just it's like, what yeah. the fuck? And then you see, you start typing... And you see all this other stuff, but then you're still on the phone with this guy. And then I started to tell him about, you know, that that from, from this thing, there came, you know, a depiction, looked like the Virgin Mary. And uh, she began, she reached out, she started to teach me how to meditate. She showed me these visions, looked like uh, uh, politics, capitalism, showed me, the corner, showed me the corner of a dollar bill and then the backside of the dollar bill with the pyramid. A couple of weeks ago, I was on Instagram and there was like, like I follow all these like conspiracy yeah. <laughs> Instagrams because they're interesting, uh -huh. some of them or whatever. And they had this one with the dollar bill that on the right corner of the dollar bill, there's like a little depiction of an owl. Did you know that? No. So on the, in, the, in the top right corner of every dollar bill by the one, in the lower right corner of the bill, you, you could pull out a dollar bill and look if you have a dollar bill on you, there is an owl. If you, if you look at it with a magnifying, you could see it with your naked eye, but if you really want to see it, you could put a magnifying glass on it and you can see that it's an owl. And you know that the owl is associated with Freemasonry. 
yeah. secret societies and yeah. all that. And then the back of the dollar bill, it showed me the the pyramid, mm -hmm. you know, and then the thing that's talking about a new new world order or a new order or whatever. I never understood why she was showing me the corner of the dollar bill. Hmm. I said, oh, you know, what is this? You know, like some conspiracy thing. But it's there. It's, she showed me the dollar bill for a reason, knowing that I would find out that connection to it. Show me this thing on that. And then she showed me these... She's showing me what I needed to see to be able to add together this montage of information. She started to show me all this stuff. And then from it, you know, this black cube, which later I found out represents Saturn, uh, the way they depict, you know, like uh, when you go to Mecca mm -hmm. and all the Muslims, they worship in Mecca, this black cube, mm -hmm. which is circle around right. There, and it's yeah. associated yeah, it's with really Saturn. Intense. And there's all this other stuff that's like representative of, of worship of Saturn. Hmm, I found out about all this stuff after having this experience. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, oh, and then from this montage of things that didn't seem to go together, there was an, an India from India, an Indian goddess with three arms, and she yeah. had a, a human face. She was attractive. He told me to look up the name Lakshmi, L-A-K-S-H-M-I. And I looked it up, and Lakshmi is the goddess of wealth and purity. So the goddess of wealth and purity is in a montage associated with politics and capitalism. Mm, interesting. And then he told me what he told me, and then I researched it some more. And when you research Isis or Aset, there's all this stuff that immediately comes up about how the story of the Virgin Mary and Jesus is stolen from the story of, uh, of Isis and her son, uh, Horus. Okay. Uh, that she was a virgin queen that was immaculately conceived from the spirit of her husband who was uh, killed by Set. Okay. You start wow. researching all this and it's just basically the, sto the Christian story that is in the Bible that major aspects of it were just taken from Egypt. Wow. Okay. So, and then that there's was all... the first story like that. That was the first, all re like most religions after that based the story of Hercules is the same. All of these stories yeah. are the same. Oh yeah. Sure. They all they're all the that. same. Yeah. Virgin mother. The guy's uh, 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 you know dies dies and uh, rises in three days. All of that shit. It's all been told a million times. But this is the original story of it. Wow. So okay. when I when right. I when I went in on that second time with her. I started to ask her questions because I watched this Terrence McKenna video where he was talking about asking the mushrooms a question and being surprised that you get an answer. So I asked her, I said, she was showing me a montage and it looked like it was an abundance of everything, all different cultures, all different types of things that didn't seem to go together. Like everything from aliens to religious figures and things and mathematics and this. And I said, what is this? What is this? Like, what is the answer to this world and all that? I said, what is this? What is this? And it, it, she instantly, instantly replied, she says, it is everything. That the answer to all of this in life is all of it. All of this stuff exists and is real. And, and it's all essentially boiling down to being the same thing. Interesting. Well, and then she said in, in relation to, to creating, to making, anything that you do creatively, she said that we make to remember. Hmm. And, it, and it really resonated with me. What she was saying to me resonated with me because I understood to remember, it. remember, like, information? Like you, the... You're having a telepathic conversation. Yeah. And, the, and her answers are immediate. Immediate. With, and not even with her, with other... Uh, beings that I encountered doing this kind of stuff, the answers are not plotted in you yeah. to have a conversation with yourself. It's not that. And what I understood by, about it is that when you get into, I, I used to call it going into autopilot. You know when you're at a wall and you can fucking paint it, you'd be like, holy shit, I've been painting this piece for fucking 13 hours. Mm -hmm. And it's been so hot that I sweat everything out and I didn't even pee. Right. But maybe I peed once. I, I used to say doing that is like being an autopilot. I just get into this zone of painting an autopilot yeah. and you just get lost in it. You know, and it, mm -hmm. it just you just do it. There's something called flow states, like being able to tap into flow states that I that I learned that that's what other motherfuckers call it. They call it tapping into a flow state. Okay. Just about to say that. Yeah. So when people tap into a flow state, they're able to just produce and create 
and get into something really deep and they're unlocking this natural ability inside of themselves to tune in and create something that you're surprised by when you create it. Mm. And that's what art is. So I think that when we get into the practice of being creatives, we're unlocking potential inside of us that's already there. We're just being familiar with it. Yeah. We're, we're remembering what it is that we can actually do. So I'm gonna get down to the real reason of this story. This is just this moment getting answers from Gano to look up names on Google, to researching it myself and finding out that all these different things that you know were shown to me and that I recorded after coming out of all these DMT experiences, we would record them yeah. and looking back and listening to that stuff and also having it directly in my mind. It's like if we were walking down the street and some, something really traumatic happened, you're going to remember sure, all of it, yeah. every inch of it. Yeah. That's this experience. Wow. I started research it more. And at that point in my life, I, I had an affirmation. What she was trying to do was give me an affirmation that what I was experiencing wasn't a hallucination. It wasn't something just concocted in my mind, like, oh, Joe, you've done it now. You fucking went off the deep end. Now you're fucking seeing fucking gods and yeah, entities yeah. and shit like that. It's not that. Yeah. It, you're just tuning into something that's already been there, that's already been in you. Yeah. So I did it. It shook, it shook my world up. I was trying to figure out what to do with this information, how it tied into my life. At this point, it was January. I turned 39 on January 21st. This happened right before my birthday. I turned 39. I was very reflective about all this. I was preparing for an art show, and I decided to try to share DMT with other people that I knew that I thought it could help them and benefit. Yeah. And I started to try to apply the things that were shown to me or, or, or revealed or whatever. And I started to set up moods and bring certain people in and do DMT sessions. And each time I did it, I would get a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further to a point that I was going in and I wasn't seeing <clears throat> entities anymore. I was just in what felt like a, a computer generated loading program where it looked like there was just a whole bunch of things moving around, moving about. And I was like, I don't want to see this. I want to have a conversation with entities. And then I would try to look away from things and not look at things, but then it would keep showing it to me in my face. And then I try to look away and it was a whole bunch of these kind of shapes, a lot of these kind of moving, you know, Taurus shapes. And they were very bright and high contrast and all that. And at one point I started to get really frustrated. I looked away and then it showed it to me as all the characters in The Simpsons moving in this animated Taurus or like shape and I said, oh, that's corny. I can't tell anybody I saw this thing. They're yeah. going to think I'm crazy. Yeah. And I looked away. And then, and then I was telepathically communicating. I said, I can take any shape I want. This is what you need to see. And, I, and then I was, like, I was like, okay. And then I stopped fighting it. And then I, I laid back. And it started to show it to me. It started, it, it started to show it to me. And I paid attention, just being fixated on it. And then as I started to just stay on it and stop fighting it, it started to get brighter in color. And then a smaller version of the same moving shape started to appear in front of it. And at this point, I was so focused on it. I wasn't worried about where my arm was. I wasn't worried about what my dog is doing. Sure. I wasn't worried about the other people with candles or this or that. I was just on this. And once... I was completely on this thing moving. It took me. It pulled me out. I thought I knew what a breakthrough was by yeah. going to some room in the corner yeah. and all that. This thing, it pulled, I felt myself being pulled out like backward, like from the top of my spine or something. I felt myself being pulled out of my body and gone through like light, like through, I don't know, a tunnel or, or what, like just pulled out into some external ether outside of the earth, outside of myself, outside of all this. And then I was in this place of energy and there were other energies that I identified with as being other 
spirits, other mm. figures, not people because they weren't physical bodies, but energy. And I was like, it was revealing what what uh, people are or, or, what, or what this is. It was like almost like what this world is. And I got to a wall and I got to this wall and I said, I want to go further. It was like either a wall or a doorway or something that was blocking me from going beyond it. And I was at a point where I was like, I want to go further. I want to go further. You know, I want to have a conversation. And I was getting frustrated. And then when I would almost like shout it to them, they threw me in, a, I would be put in a room where my voice was bouncing and echoing mm. back onto myself. Wow. And it said, then it said to me, it said, do you want to live or do you want to die? And at that point, I became very aware of me not being in my body. I had forgot about it. I was so in this. Still feeling like myself, but not my physical self. I couldn't imagine my face or my body or anything like that. I lost track of connection to family, all that. I was energy. I was a soul somewhere else. And I, my knee-jerk reaction, I said, I want to live. I want to live because I felt like I didn't want to yeah, die. Yeah. And at that moment, I started to feel this sensation like I had to pee in my pants because I was fucking scared. Yeah, shit. And then I was like, oh my God, am I breathing or not? Am I, because I'm like, oh my God, am I in my body? And I started to panic, but then it shot, it, 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 it asked me if I want to live, I want to die. I said, I, I want to live. And then it said, well, then come and talk to me when you're dead. Otherwise you need to go figure it out for yourself. And then it Whoa, shot me, then shit. it shot me back down That's to this wild, midpoint. Dude. And then it started to, it brought this other like montage of clustered information that was really intense. And it started to like, I felt it like being downloaded into the top of my spine, this, this part here, like yeah. being downloaded into it. And it started to show me certain people in my life that I recognized mixed in with other information. And it I felt like it was a download and the images are just aspects of the download. And then it shot me back down. And then I was like, whoa, whoa, that was really intense. And then I talked about it. I talked about it with Victoria and all that and, and everything. And then I came back here and I was working. And then this, this guy wanted to come by here and film me painting in a studio. And I said, nah, you know, I don't want, really want to do another video of me painting in the studio. Instead, let's do something out of the box that's more relevant to what I have going on. So why don't you come down here We'll do DMT together and you could film the process and then I'm going to talk and then you could film me painting. We came here. We did that whole thing here in the studio. You can find a video on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, it's all dope. Uh, it's, it's like rhyme code you could type in yeah. and a video will come up. Uh, I immediately, when I did that here on that video, I went back out to the same place. I knew at that point when I'm in this loading program to focus on some repeated shape or light. And what it was doing was trying to hypnotize me. It's like hypnosis. You have to stay focused on something in order for it to safely remove you from mm. this reality. It was trying to pull me into a state of hypnosis. Yeah. Once you get past that part, you go out into this energy, uh, like a different dimension. And when you're there, you, you experience different things. and. I was once again asked if I wanted to live or I wanted to die. And again, the second time I said, I want to live. And then it said to me, it said, there is something that you need to take care of in your physical life. There is something you need to take care of in your life before you could go any further with this, is what it said to me. And then it showed me some images and downloaded me with something. And then it shot me back out, down into this room and I was still fully in it and I opened my eyes and it turned this whole studio into like a children's nursery. You know, like Pee Wee's Playhouse, yeah, yeah, yeah. how like the furniture is a little bit animated and all that kind of stuff, but it's very calm and friendly and welcoming. Yeah. It turned this whole place into that kind of vibe. And the paintings on the walls were all three dimensional and like spilling onto the walls and the ceilings. One of these paintings looked like a galloping horse. It was the best thing to look at unfinished paintings that way because the paintings, what DMT was doing was showing me how these paintings could evolve into something else. And it was just, 
it was very moving and puzzling. Like I just had the, one of the most ex intense experiences ever. And then I'm being thrown back into my studio and it's like just sort of making me feel like a kid, like, nah, son, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like, like, nah, son, you just like, like, like a kid, you know, come back to me when you're grown. <laughs> and, but yeah. then I was puzzled by it and I called Gano again. I told him about it. And then Gano told me, he said, he said, yo, if you're ever asked, do you want to live or do you want to die? Say you want to die. I said, what, what do you mean? Is that, does everybody know this? He's like, yeah, man, don't you know? <laughs> and then other people, uh, Victoria said, same. You say, yeah, you're supposed to say you want to die. It's like a trick question. Right. Like you're supposed to shed an aspect of yourself. I was like, I was like, oh, okay. Uh -huh. But then I was like, nah, nah. And then I, after that time with the DMT with, in the studio with this dude, I went home and I told Victoria, I said, you know, Victoria, I don't think I could do DMT again for a while. It said to me, that I needed to figure something out in my life before I could go any further. Like something has to change. And she said, oh yeah, you know, I had a similar experience with it as well. That time we did it, you know, with so-and-so. And I said, yeah, I don't know. I, I think maybe, maybe it's this art show. Maybe my mind is too much on preparing art and it's distracting me from being able to connect further. That's what I thought it was. But then I ended up having the art show I ended up having the art show. I was satisfied with the work. I was proud of what I made or whatever, but I didn't feel any different. Ended up having fun. We did some mushrooms at an after party. We had a great two nights following, you yeah. know, just letting loose. I didn't have to pa make paintings. So I was like being free again. And then on a Saturday, I was like waking up at like 1 p.m. and I was on my phone and while I was on my phone, I was like answering an email back from a gallerist in France about how the show went. And I sent it and then it accidentally took me to the next email, which was a, like, a, like what I thought was a junk email from 23andMe. Do you know this, this website, 23andMe? It's like you, familiar, you, spit, no. you spit in a vial. And then, and then uh, it tells you where you're from and oh, all yeah, that yeah. kind of DNA, stuff. Yeah. DNA a DNA test. Yeah. test. Yeah. And you can do it and you can find out if you're Neanderthal yeah. or if you're prone to Parkinson's disease or if you're Italian or French or, you know, uh, Indian, whatever. Yeah. You know, uh, it tells you all that kind of stuff. So I got a junk mail from 23andMe and I was like, ah, you know, it's like I sent somebody flowers on 1-800-Flowers once and now I get all these junk mails yeah, yeah, yeah. for 1-800-Flowers. I, I just would always just not read them because it's like- Do you like, do 23andMe? They, they, get you, they get you to participate in studies and all this okay. kind of- Okay. About- But did, did you do the 23, you did the DNA test? About three to four years ago. I, I gotta figure out when. When I first moved, so when I first moved back to New York, I, had, I was living out in California. I lived out there for eight years, six years in LA, two years in Sacramento. Yeah. And I ended a relationship in Sacramento and I felt like, you know what? I can't stay in Sacramento anymore. And I didn't want to go back to LA because I left LA because the sheriff's department had come to my house and they had already arrested Revoke. And I was like, I ain't, ain't no way I'm trying to go to county jail. Yeah. So I said, I'm out. I, I left LA and I was living in Sacramento quietly for two years, made no money in Sacramento, had to travel a lot to make money and stuff like that. And when my relationship ended, I felt like I didn't need to be there and yeah. I didn't want to go back to LA. I didn't want to be in the Bay either. So I had to pick a city. I thought maybe I'd go to Detroit. I thought I'd go to Detroit, but then going out to Detroit, I realized everything fucking cl would close down at 10 PM and I'm a nocturnal motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, 10 PM is early for me and that city would shut down at night. And I said, oh, this city ain't for me. So I decided to move back to New York. Yeah. But I said, nah, I don't want to live in new New York. I want to live in the New York that I knew yeah. when I was younger. I intentionally moved to central Brooklyn. Uh, I found a place in Kensington. I moved in there and I was actually like a mile from where I grew up as a kid. Oh, cool. And I grew up really dysfunctional. I grew up very dysfunctional. Uh, my mom had four kids. All, all four of us were from different fathers. My mom had us as, as, as a teenager, you know, she had her first kid when she turned 16, hmm. uh, my older brother, Jason. She had a kid with a Puerto Rican drug dealer, some guy with an Afro. 
And, uh, you know, she was of Irish Italian descent. And when it was found out that she was pregnant by this guy who was like 21 and she was 15 yeah. and had a kid at 16, they were all angry. And I think my aunt Dolly was working at a bar when she was 18 and she got some guys from the bar and they beat this guy up and they told him to keep his spick ass away from, you know, their sister. And then they were trying to take her son away, my, my older brother. And she said, no, this is my kid. Wow. And my grandmother said, if you have another kid, you're going to get kicked out of the house. Oh, wow. Okay. So she had her kid and then got a job as a waitress at a Greek diner on New Utrecht Avenue. Uh, you know that spot we painted? Over there, like the end line over there. She was okay. she's at a Greek yeah. diner over there. Uh, and she was just trying to work and yeah. be in school and have a kid. Yeah. And uh, she, a couple of months after having a kid, got out of work and was walking to the bus stop or whatever. And some guy drove up, rolled down the window and was like, hey, baby, you know, you know, you want to come with me? Come. Don't take the bus. Come with me. Come to come to a party. I'm going to a party. And she's like, no, no, she ain't never been to no party. Yeah. You know, she grew up. Her father was passed. My her father, my grandfather climbed the Verrazano Bridge for a six pack of beer. Oh shit! Is on a the cover of the <laughs> Damn, da- that's wild co- cover of the Daily News, September eleventh, nineteen sixty nine. My grandfather is on the cover of the Daily News. It said it's, it's it said his name, Tightrope Tierney. It said uh, it showed one picture of him up there, up on the you know the arch towers, you know like Ver- Ver- Verrazano yeah, Bridge, yeah. Saturday Night Fever. Yeah. He was in a bar in, in, in Fort Hamilton or Bay Ridge or whatever, and they were arguing about whether or not he could have worked on that bridge, that he would have been scared of heights. Okay. And he said, oh, I could have worked on a guinea gangplank. That's what they called it, I guess, because all the Italians moved to Staten Island after. And he said, oh, yeah, I'll go up there right now. And he bet him, and he took the alcohol up there, climbed up the, the cables, yeah, yeah. and went all the way up to the top. He was Holy chilling shit. up there drinking and- uh, <laughs> Enjoying his wild. reward. The, he was told he stopped caring about life because he was told that he only had a couple of months to live. Oh, okay. So a, as a result Before of him- Before the- not, this, the that, I that think the it. reason why he didn't care about dying is because he was told he was going to die. Okay. And they said a part of his dying had to do with the alcoholism and some of the stuff, and he was just killing himself. Yeah. So this guy who died a couple of months after this- situation was up there drinking watching the sun come up in this really reflective moment in his life was not a good father to his children was not a provider you know uh was an alcoholic the police and people saw this guy up there thought he was trying to kill himself it was the last thing he was trying to do because he knew he was going to die he wanted to live and was coping with the fact that he was going to die and then the police went up there they tried to get him and they started you know, trying to do some cat and mouse thing. And he was mad that they didn't take the cables up, that they went in through the arch itself, through like a stairway or something like that. He started a fight with them. So there's one picture of him up there and there's another picture of him cuffed, all jolly and smiling and huh. like stepping over the mid divider with two cops. And he just looked happy as That's fuck. That's fucking awesome. And they, and they portrayed it like he's just having a bet, but they threw him in Bellevue, which is a psychiatric institution okay. or whatever, but he died. But he wasn't a provider, so my aunt, was taking care of all of her brothers and sisters and my my grandmother didn't work. And my mom grew up in a household of neglect and she wasn't ever taught about, you know, the birds and the bees and all this kind of shit. She didn't know anything about anything. And she just gets fucking, you know, swooned into sex on the streets of Brooklyn. So she ends up getting in the car with this guy who's hollering at us. She just had a kid. She said, you want to go to a party? And he gets her to go in a car. She goes to a car, goes to a party. They end up having sex one time, she says. And she got pregnant. She got pregnant and she was like, oh my God, I'm going to get kicked out of the house. So she didn't know what to do. This was in the spring of 1978. And she started to, she didn't tell anybody and she started to hide it. By the time the fall came around, she could wear big jackets and sweatshirts in the house and all that. Nobody was paying attention to her yeah. anyway because she had a bunch of other brothers and sisters there or whatever. And she hid the pregnancy the entire time. Wow. 
the entire time up until her water broke. I found out about this when she was when I was 17. Wow. When I was young, she gave me all this misinformation as to who my father was. Oh wow. She, her water broke. She went across the hall middle of the night to her Aunt June's doorway and knocked on her door because she didn't want to tell her mom because she didn't want to get in trouble. So her and this, her and the guy that she hooked up, they didn't communicate after that. No, night. no, they didn't. She started a panic. She started a panic while she was pregnant and went to work and told the people at work what was happening. Okay. And while she was pregnant, the, this, these Greek diner people were like, well, we have a solution for you. Our friend, George, just came here from Greece. He snuck off a Greek trading ship. He, he just came here and he needs to marry somebody to stay in his country for papers. Okay. So if you marry him, he'll be a father to your children. Yeah. And he'll support you if you get kicked out of the house. Yeah. And my mom was like trying to figure it out. And she says, no, I'm going to tell this guy. And she was going to tell my father. And she had ran into my father's friend who she knew that he hung out with him and said, hey, the guy's name was Frankie. And she's like, Frankie, I need you to go get Nat. All she knew was the guy's name was Nat. Okay. That's it. Wow. And she says, I, I need you to find Nat and tell him to come here. I have to talk to him. I have to talk to him. The day that something like the day, my mom said the day that he came there, was this whole situation unfolding with this guy, George, this Greek illegal immigrant yeah. who's speaking through a translator to get her to agree to marry him. And on that day, that guy said, don't tell him, don't tell him, I'll be a father to your ch children. And then she didn't tell him. The guy came, she didn't tell my birth father anything. Never really saw, she saw him two other times after that but never talked to him again. It was oh, wow. like, it was like a hookup. She ends up having her water breaks, tells my aunt June across the hall, they all lived in an apartment building in uh, Sunset Park. And aunt June opens up in a nightgown, you know, and it's like, it's like, Jackie, what's going on? She's like, aunt June, I need you to take me to the hospital. She's like, why, what's the matter, are you okay? She's like, I need you to take me to the hospital, I'm gonna have a baby. And she's like, what, you're pregnant? She's like, yes, please don't tell my mother. Oh, wow. <laughs> she said, please don't tell my mother. And then she drives her to the hospital. She goes in for this, you know, to have a baby, uh, which is me. Yeah. And Aunt June ends up waking up my grandmother and it's like, you're never going to get Jackie's pregnant. And it's like a devastating news to everyone because right under their nose in their fucking house is this woman who's pregnant. Yeah. Never went to no doctor for prenatal care or all these things that people do for having children and stuff yeah. like that. Didn't do any of yeah. that. No, who knows? Probably around people fucking smoking and all that kind yeah. of stuff. And that's where I came out of. Wow. They didn't uncircumcise me or anything. They just fucking, I became circumcised at six. That's why you gave me that transformer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but. Because <laughs> you were transformed after that. <laughs> I, I got a hernia at six and then they, when I went under the doctors tricked my mom because we were on Medicaid. Okay. To get a circumcision since, hey, we're going to be down there. Let's circumcise them. There you go. Yeah. So anyway, my mom got out of the hospital and her bags were all thrown across the hall in my Aunt June's house. She did get kicked out of the house. And then she went and moved in with this Greek guy and they got married outside of City Hall. There used to be this picture of them in a photo album outside of City Hall eating hot dogs. And the hot dog vendor took the picture of them getting married, <laughs> you know, at, at a hot dog stand eating wow. hot dogs. They got married. They had a, a, a kid shortly after, my brother Demos. And uh, Demos is a year and a half younger than me. Uh, we were together, they were together and we were told that this guy, George, is daddy. He's all our dads, mm. you know? And so from up to four years old, I thought this guy was my father. Yeah. And then at four, my brother's father had developed a cocaine addiction, a heavy cocaine addiction spent all the money, all the rent money on drugs, coke or whatever, and didn't have enough money to pay rent. So my mom called my aunt who moved to Staten Island. It was like, like Dolly, the, you know, George spent all the money on drugs. We have no rent money. She came with a van, moved all our shit to Staten Island. That's how I moved to Staten Island. Wow. Uh, and while I was there, we moved to Midland Beach in a little beach bungalow. And then my aunt said, my mom said, uh, oh, you know, uh, daddy is not your daddy. He's only Demos's daddy. And then we were just confused four years old. I remember like 
What do you mean he's not he's not our father? He's like, you guys both have different fathers. This is Demos' father. And then I said, I said, well, where's where's our father? You know, where's my father? Yeah. And she said, oh, well, well, your your father's both of your daddies ran away. So I had this image in my mind of two men holding hands running up the street away. Wow. And that's what I believe that, oh, my father ran away. And then Demos's father ended up getting his getting clean and moving up to New Hampshire and starting a successful business. And Demos would go visit him, taking Greyhound up there to New Hampshire. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes we would go and he was like, had it together. We would eat lobsters and stuff like that. And we're like, wow, we're eating seafood, you know? And, uh, and then when I was eight years old, my mom, I asked my mom about my father again. And she pulled me into the other room and said, my father died. And then I felt really sad because I was never going to meet this person to treat me special yeah. because growing up, there was a lot of uneven treatment between me and my brothers. My brother, Angelo, who's my stepdad, Jose's kid would get treated with more favor to him or my brother Demos would get treated with more favor to his father. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't really get things. I knew yeah. that if I wanted to get something, I would have to be able to afford it and work and be able to get it myself. Uh, but I felt like, oh, I'm not going to meet my father. I'm never going to have this aspect of myself. And it was very sad. I remember crying as a kid and yeah, stuff like that. And then, I, and then when at 12, there was just a lot of turmoil and craziness in the house, uh, a lot of physical abuse. I grew up being hit and all that yeah. kind of stuff. My mom was on drugs. My mom spent all of our savings on, on drugs and uh, took my paper route and all this kind of stuff. Couldn't Anything that I saved up as a kid. And we were taken out of that family structure and went to go live with my aunt at 12 years old. That's how I got into graffiti. Okay. Because I was looking for something. I had a void in my life. I was yeah. looking for something. So I got into graffiti. That's why I still do graffiti in some ways because of this pain of my childhood. And graffiti helped to sort of work some of that out. So I ended up doing graffiti a bunch, getting kicked out of living with my aunt in Staten Island. That's how I moved to New Jersey. And when I was living in, with my parents, my stepdad and my mom, again, in New Jersey, we moved into a crowded house in Perth Amboy. There was no room at the moment. We were sleeping in the hallway. Then I was sleeping in a bedroom with uh, my three brothers and my cousin Pedro, who was sleeping there, too. Damn. We were all lined up <laughs> in a fucking room, you know, just growing up with what you have. Yeah, sure. And uh, I just got more into graffiti. I thought I was going to quit graffiti. I ended up doing more graffiti. And I was trying to figure out myself through graffiti. I was very introverted and just lost. And then one time my mom, I got a, drunk a little bit on like a Thanksgiving or something. And something happened where my brother, my older brother went crazy and became a Mormon. And then he went and got a computer. And then he figured out, found out who his father was by looking him up on a computer. And uh, he found his father. Then the subject of fathers came up and they said, oh, what about your father? And I said to my, I said, well, mommy said my father's dead. And then my mom said, I never said he was dead. I said, yeah, you did, mom. When I, when I was like, when we lived on Armstrong Avenue in Brooklyn, in, in Staten Island, you said he was dead. So I never said that. I was only with him one time. And I said, what? And then she told me that she hid the pregnancy the entire time. Oh, wow. She told me that at, and it was 96, I was like 17. Damn. And I remember going and painting a freight in Old Bridge, you know, in the freight yard. Yeah. And I wrote product of the one of a one night stand on the side of my freight. I went wow. painting with chip in a freight yard. But it just did this thing to me where it made me feel like a fluke. Like one second too long inside of someone gets you a child and that's you. And it, it could have not happened just yeah. as easily wow. as it happened. But it really threw me for a loop. Digest every few years of my childhood was sort of getting acclimated to a new idea of myself. And I remember feeling lost and wondering where I came from. My mom didn't know any information. She said his name was Nat. Uh, and that, you know, he's from Brooklyn and maybe he was Polish or something like that. She didn't know. And I just continue on doing graffiti. You became aware of my graffiti. And uh, I moved to L.A., lived to L in L.A., was very dysfunctional, couldn't keep a relationship because I kept running into issues, kept trying to figure myself out, uh, got into my 30s and moved back to New York 
in 2013. Uh, 2013, I was 34 years old, still trying to figure myself out, still trying to reconnect with who I am, moved within a mile of where I was born in Brooklyn, trying to reconnect with that side of myself and resolve whatever hangups I have from my childhood. So I came up with this idea. I was watching, listening to podcasts, Radio Lab, yeah. and they would have ads for 23andMe or, or, or DNA sites. And I said, well, maybe I'll do the DNA test. So I went and bought a DNA test for me and my girlfriend on, on, uh, on her birthday. We spit into some vials, sent it out. It goes to like Southern California or whatever, and you start getting results back. And at the same time, I was thinking about hiring a private investigator because my mom said that she did see him one time at a, at a car service near where we lived and it looked like he worked there at a car service. Right. And I made her go on Google Maps and show me where this car service was. And it's like a Buddhist center now. And I was gonna try to hire a private investigator to look up tax records to this business yeah. to see if there was a car service and maybe there was someone with the name Nat or something like yeah. that. So I didn't have any other information on this yeah. guy. So there was that. But then I get busy being an artist, you know, doing my thing, traveling, having a good time living. And did the DNA test, got it back, found out that I was like a high percentage of Italian. Hmm. You know, I have my, my last name is an Irish last name. I thought I would have a lot of Irish, especially that I have a beard that grows like a reddish color. Yeah. I thought, oh, I must be a lot of Irish. But it said something low, like I was only like like, like 8% or 7% Irish. Wow, okay. And then I was like like 74% uh, Italian. Oh, cool. And then like another percentage, which was generally Mediterranean, and then like some of these other variables. And I was like, damn. I was like, okay. Yeah. And then, and then I was looking on this site, trying to see if there were any relatives, because they compare you with people to say, oh, this person's a cousin, this person's this, this person's that. And there was, there was nobody, there was nobody connected to, you know, this, this paternal side of myself. And I just sort of, after, I looked for about a year, kept checking back at it, and nothing came up. And then I just sort of just let it go. I got busy. I started doing art shows and stuff like that. And, and I, I taught myself how to paint more serious with a paintbrush, got into that and just sort of forgot about that, forgot about that uh, DNA test. Mm -hmm. I took it. So I found out the results in 2018. I think I took it in 2014. Oh, wow. Okay. So it was actually longer. It was, it was four years ago but, oh, wow. that okay. I took this test. Yeah and just completely forgot about it. Victoria would go on there and do surveys and find out if she's prone to this or that yeah. and would get all nerded out on it. And I was just too busy doing me to get wrapped it in, up into the idea of me. Uh, and all of this continued to be the way it was. Got into doing mushrooms more serious, got into doing other psychedelics more serious, got into doing DMT was told that I needed to resolve something before I can go any further with this, that there's something that's holding me back in my life. And it was all understood to me. I told it to Victoria. It's in recordings that I have. And within a week of the last time it told it to me, I did the art show, didn't feel any different. Two nights after the art show, I get this email thought it was junk, was about to delete this 23andMe email, and it was from some woman named Jessica. And she said, she said, hey, according to 23andMe, we're first cousins. And if we're first cousins, we have over 23, you have over 23 cousins or 26 cousins. Please call me, you know, here's my number. And I could see this backlog of, of messages through 23andMe of her oh, wow. for like two months. She's been, had been trying to contact me. Wow. And I just wasn't looking. Yeah. And I ended up like getting on the phone with her and she was just all giddy, some woman in her mid forties, mid to late forties in Florida. And she was just like all excited to talk to me. Yeah. And then she put me on a three-way call with some woman named Maria. And then they were going all giddy and stuff like that. And, uh, 
they're all happy to have a new cousin or something that they yeah. didn't know anything about. But all I wanted to know was who was my father. Yeah. Because uh, like a lot of people who grow up not knowing aspects of themselves, especially with their parents, yeah. identity is, is a big deal. You know, that's why we latch on to cultural things or, or where we come from. Uh, oh, uh, you know, St. Patrick's Day, I'm Irish. It's a day to be Irish or yeah, something like yeah, that, yeah. to hang on to these different things that we form these narratives of who we are. Uh, I grew up with abuse, with chaos, with drug things circling around me, all this turmoil, being poor, all this kind of stuff. And I was trying to get myself back up to being a progressive human being, but this thing was holding me back. So these, these two women are all giddy and I say, hey, look, you know, the reason why that we're related is because I don't know anything about my father. Uh, do you think that maybe one of your relatives could be my father? And then they're like, oh, well, who could it be? They said, well, some of the men in our family got around or whatever, they weren't true to their wives or whatever. And they were talking about their, their uncle this or their uncle that or whatever. And I said, well, my mom said his name was Nat or Nathan or something like that. And they said, oh, well, we don't, you know, my father's name is this, Vinny, this, this one's name is this and that. And then they were talking to each other and they said, oh, well, it couldn't be cousin Natale. And then, and they're like, oh, well, it couldn't be him because they're cousins. But then they're like, oh, but we're double cousins because two, two men, two brothers in Italy fell in love with two sisters in Italy from the same town. Okay. And they all got together and had a bunch of children. Yeah. And then all of those Italians from Calabria, Italy moved to New York and they all had children. Yeah. And they all grew up really tight, but I don't know if it's because two, two brothers married two sisters that it yeah. makes it some sort of weird little thing or whatever. And they said, well, I said, well, what about this name, Natale? Where is this guy? He said, oh, well, he still lives in New York. I said, okay, is he alive? He said, yeah, he's alive. I said, well, do you have any pictures of him? You know, maybe I could show these pictures to my mom. And they, they, they said, okay, we're going to call you back. You call your mom and ask her if he had an Italian accent. And I said, okay, I'm going to find out right now. Please send me the pictures. So they're going on Facebook or whatever, these, these women. And I call my mom and I'm like, mommy, listen, you know, I know it bothers you that whenever I ask about my father. It's a sensitive topic for her. I said, but listen, this thing happened. I'm talking to these women on 23andMe. Did this guy have an Italian accent? And she said, no, he didn't have no Italian accent. He kind of sounded like, you know, he was from, from Brooklyn. You know, he sounded like he could have been in the movie Bronx Tale. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, she said, she said, we used to call his type, uh, we call it a uh, Guidos. I said, mommy, you never told me he was Italian. She said, yeah, he was very, you know, like, like, an, like a guy from the neighborhood. I said, okay. Well, I said, well, they're going to send me some pictures. And I said, hold on. They're texting me now. I'm going to send you these pictures. I sent her these pictures. And before I even sent her these pictures, I seen this wedding picture of my father when he was like 23 years old. And I could see my face in his face. Wow. And it was just so weird and eerie to see this mystery in front of you in a, in a picture on your phone. And... I, I like it was just it was just shocking. Yeah. I sent it to her, and there was another picture of him with his wife and son, where he the son is blowing out candles, and the son when he was younger looked just like me as the, at the same age. Wow, it was just really strange. And I sent it to my mom, and my mom she speaks into her phone because she doesn't like text. Yeah, so it's like like oh my god, Joe, that's him. Wow, look at look at his son. He looks just like you. And then I was just wow. like, I was just like trying not to be emotionally wrapped up in this because I don't want to feel let down. I send this stuff to them. I get on the phone with them. They're all giddy and excited and happy. Like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I'm like, well, look, you know, is it possible to, to talk to him? And they said, well, we lost touch with him, but we're in touch with his sister who lives in Trenton. Her name is Amelia. And uh, we can call her and then we'll call you back. So they go ahead and they call her. And they end up calling me back on like a group call, conference call or whatever. And this woman who's, you know, in the second half of her 60s is fucking thrown off 
by this whole situation and is very skeptical and starts asking me questions as to who I am, who my mom was, asking me street names, asking me all the stuff because she was old. She's the older sister of oh, my yeah. supposed father. Yeah. And she's very protective of him. Okay. Uh, she never had any children herself. She's one of three siblings. And my father is the only one to ever have a kid. Oh, wow. My brother is, is, so they all put a lot of energy into his son. Wow. And then they're finding out in their 60s that there's this other person who happened before he got married and all that. So she's asking me all these questions. I'm saying this Greek diner on New Utrecht Avenue, uh, 55th Street, Fort Hamilton Parkway, this thing, that thing. Uh, she thinks he had a car service. She always hung around with this guy that looked this way, whatever. And all of it added up. And then she's just confused by it. And she says to the, the people who I'm on, the, the other relatives on the phone call, she's like, and he contacted you? And then the, and then the, the cousin, uh, the cousin, like Jessica said, no, we contacted him. We've been trying to contact him for months. It's in the DNA. It's mm. in the DNA. And then this woman, Amelia, she was just thrown off, but she real, finally started to realize that this is a real thing. And she said, well, it's kind of strange that all of this just happened because my brother, Natale, just walked through my front door. Whoa. Now, she's in Trenton, and this guy just popped, up, popped up in a yeah, house at the same time shit. that I'm on the phone with them. Wow. And I said, and I, you know, I, I don't know what the fuck. I said, well, can I talk to him? And she's like, no, 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 no. I need to talk to him first and just, you know, break the, I need to talk to him first before we do anything. And I said, well, listen, there are some things that I can send you that sort of support all this or whatever. Do you text? She's like, yeah, I text. She, she's like a professional woman, retired. She knows, she knows how to navigate a fucking cell phone. So I texted her everything like, like a lawyer would, you know, like screenshots of the DNA stuff, screenshots of phone conversations, pictures of me at the same age as this son of his, pictures of me, send it all to her. And she texted me that night. She says, oh, I told, broke the news to Natale. As you can imagine, this is a lot to take in, but it is good news. We do need a few days to, to soak this all in. We'll be in touch. And I didn't hear from them for like two days. And then I started to wonder, are they confirming it? Are they not confirming it? I was here in a studio, just puzzled, alone, didn't know how to process it. I remember taking a shower and like I was in the shower, like I didn't, I didn't want to be open with my feelings in front of Victoria, who was all happy for me. I, like, I'm like taking a shower and on one hand I'm laughing and on the other hand I'm like teary eyed and crying. It's like this confusing sort of mixed yeah. emotion thing. Because as a man, I think we bottle up a lot of pain that we have in order to go forward and be tough and be strong and all this kind of stuff. But we carry a lot of unresolved shit from our history yeah. being a child. For sure. Or being a teenager. Anything yeah. that has emotionally impacted you. It's all there buried down in this chronological series of shit that you call yourself. You know? So I ended up being here in the studio painting for two days. My other brother, Demos, the one who his father snuck off a Greek trading ship, he popped up here. He was doing some renovations for a friend of mine. I lured him over to eat Indian food with me. He don't eat no Indian food, but I lured him over to eat Indian food. And while I was in the Indian restaurant, these people call me in that Spice and Grill. <laughs> they called me while I was in there. And uh, I picked up the phone and, you know, they were on a conference call in Trenton. And it was like all these Rocco's, you know, <laughs> Rocco and I'm your uncle Rocco, I'm your uncle Joe. Wow. Like all these people, they all gathered together and had like a talk, broke the news to, I have a brother named Vinny, Vinny Pirelli. Wow. <laughs> uh, broke the news to him and I got on the phone with all these people. They were all talking to me. And then I finally got on the phone with my father and oh, he talks kind of like, yeah, like, like, oh, hey, yo, hey. he talks like this, like, yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, well, really, you, you're my son, uh, you know, like, like that, like, yeah. he talks, <laughs> talks like this, and it was just this moment where I was just like, 
still that that whole time just trying to soak it all up just being puzzled and just bewildered by all this and then also weighing it against less than a week prior i was told all this shit in dmt about having to let something go about going further before going further with it and it just it's just like you know, it's like when you see something that's beyond what you accept or whatever, and then seeing that it makes sense, but just like, you know, yeah. I ended up going down to Trenton, meeting these people. Uh, I found out my brother is a street performer. Really? Have you ever, do you, do you ever look at my Instagram? Yeah. So on my Instagram, sometimes I'll post these stories of this guy who dresses up. That's your bro? As a, exactly yeah. as a jolly cat, as a jolly cat, that's your brother. That's my fucking brother. I had no idea. That motherfucker is my brother. Because I seen one, and it was at like a dinner or something. I was like, I wonder who this dude is. This is my new family. The Holy fucking shit. man, Italian ass family. Wow. <laughs> so, so my brother dresses up. He has the the top part of his outfit is an elf. Then he has a hood that has bunny rabbit ears. Then he wears an American flag bandana. Then a backwards hat. And he has a pink ukulele and he calls himself the Jolly Cat. And he performs on trains and in Times Square every fucking night. He's an artist. In a- yeah, he's, a, he's an eccentric. He's a yeah. creative. And I totally get it because doing something unconventional and making a living at it is what I do. Yeah, totally. You know? Uh, Actually, wow. some of his performance style reminds me of you because he's good at rallying a whole bunch of people yeah. to kind of doing something. This about breaking out of the norm or kind of yeah. out yeah. of their comfort zone. Yeah. His whole routine is that. Amazing. Yeah. Holy shit. So I ended up meeting all these people and everything like that. I found out, you know, they come from Calabria, Italy. It's like south of Naples. Uh, my father moved. My father's born in Italy. He came here when he was a kid. Wow. Uh, I told him, <laughs> I told him when I first met him, I said, you know, I was going to look you up through this car service my mom told me about you know i was going to look up tax records and see if i could find your name and he said he said he went like he went what huh that was a fugazi operation <laughs> <laughs> and i said huh? he said that was just a front and i said okay <laughs> and i said well how what did you do for work he said you know i did a little this a little bit of that a yeah. couple of cash businesses we had a couple, some car services. <laughs> you know, we 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 organized some dances. <laughs> we 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 dealt. I I I dealt in memorabilia, like like all this stuff Yo. that's like, like you know, like it's just like okay, yeah, okay, all that's right. And then you start unraveling these different aspects of their past that are like, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, like. Very New York, yeah. very Italian yeah. type of things, you know. Yeah, uh, and Brooklyn it's Brooklyn Italian kind of things, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and it's very interesting. And so, to bring it all together, I've developed a relation relationship with them. He, they both, my father and my brother, they live separately in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn, and I. I've gone down. I went to the racetrack with them for a barbecue. I met a bunch of relatives. I, he had a birth. Him and his, my father and my brother have a birthday on the same day in July. Really? Went down there. And what, what, it's, what it did for me is it removed this tremendous weight. All of this unresolved abandonment issues stemming from not knowing who my father is and also feeling a lack of worth for being in that position and f- growing up in a situation with a lot of hurt, dysfunction, and pain, adding on to that, uh, I carried a lot of that with me. And it was a big motivator in being accomplished at something. Mm. I felt like if I could be accomplished at something, if I could be accepted f- for being great at, say, painting or something like that, that it would validate me being here, that I'm more than some sex that just went too far yeah you know and it did that it it, it re- released a tremendous cynical pain that i've had wow amazing. and i and amazing. i felt it and then after when i did dmt i went out to la for that beyond the street show yeah this all just happened wow oh, this all shit. just happened i went out there for that beyond the this street what, show like four months ago five it months happened ago? the end i found out the end of april 
Wow. And then I, when I went out, the next time I did DMT, I knew that I was going to go really far because it told me. Yeah, you got the next level. So, yeah, it told me. Ready so the next level. I ended Easy. up coming out there and I brought the DMT experience to a few people in L.A. And we ended up doing it at a friend's studio on a dingy ass floor of like an old mechanic shop. I did it on a movers blanket with this other dude's like old hooded sweatshirt that he keeps in the back of his car, like laying on that. And it, the, the overall message, the overall feeling of, I went through a few different layers of it. And what I was, I felt like I was being downloaded with a tremendous sense of love. It sounds kind of corny and cliche. Whenever people get down to essential understandings of the world and everything like that, they always get back to this, this, this connectivity to love. Mm. And that they say all these cliche sayings, love conquers all, or the strongest thing in, in, in life is love or, or whatever. But I felt myself being in downloaded with love, like really physically vibrating, feeling the sense in me. Wow. And I was going through all of these things that were associated with family and positivity. And it was telling me that, that the way to fix a lot of these issues in the world right now, because we all generally agree, if you have some type of fucking sense and you get the fuck out of your neighborhood and you go down to South America and all these other fucking places, yeah. you figure out that the world is kind of fucked up and unfair. Sure. And that we intentionally are doing things knowing that what we're doing is destroying this world. Yep. You know, and we're contributing to things that are self-destructive. Yep. You know all that and you say, well, how are we going to do it? How are we going to fix this? Well, the world is going to hit, the shit is going to hit the fan. We're all waiting for a fucking civil war in this country, in America. We're all waiting for a police state to be dropped down on us and for everyone to go run the guns and be chaos and then we all get locked down. We, we all can sense some chaos about to fucking happen in this world. Yeah. And then you say, well, what can I do about it? I know what I could do. I'm gonna go kill all those other motherfuckers. I'm gonna go overthrow the government and all this. And you think like that, but then you, when, you go, when I go into this experience, she said, and it's, it's a female, every, every time that I've gone in, it's been a female entity, a female presence, like a loving, nurturing presence that I'm, that I'm interacting with. So the, the key, the way to, to heal this, this world is not with more of that. It's to first heal yourself and get yourself into a, a state of being uh, uh, positive and resolved and, and, and being able to experience love. And then going out and influencing that by interacting with others by being positive with others. And, and that energy is infectious. If someone comes into the room and they have a really fucking shitty ass attitude, it affects everybody in the fucking room. Yep. You're like, yo, motherfucker, why'd you come out and hang out with us if you're gonna be such an asshole? Yeah. Just the same, you, someone could come into a room and infect the entire room because they have a very strong positive attitude. Yeah. And it's about the ability to be able to tap into that. That if you, if you have the ability to be toxic and negatively infectious, you have the ability to do the opposite. And it has more of a sway on infecting things in this world. It starts with you, and then it spreads by putting that energy out into other one. And it was saying that we're all energy and all this and that or whatever. And then it started showing me on the roof of this fucking, on, on a ceiling in this guy's fucking studio, it was all these depictions of children and like family structure and like, like, like mothers and stuff. I felt like it was trying to tell me to have kids and everything like that. It, it was like, it was like I get my aunts and parents and them trying to pressure me into having a kid and now fucking DMT is trying to pressure me into having a kid. But I came out of it, I came out super positive with it. That's amazing. Uh, I felt resolved in a lot of ways. I ended up learning, I did it six times while I was in LA with different groups of people. And I came to another epiphany that hanging on to being angry with people because maybe they didn't do something they said that they were going to do 
or maybe you know I felt like that they took advantage of me or, or, or they were being inconsiderate or selfish and hanging on to whatever anger I had that I needed to let that go because every time you make a decision, you draw lines in the sand with people, you have to remember and keep putting that line back down because if you leave it alone unattended, that line in the sand is just going to sort of fade a bit. You have to keep reinforcing yeah. it. And I said, you know what? It, it, it's true. I've seen the benefit of letting go of baggage from my past. I'm going to let go of this. And I reached out to people who have upset me or I, I cut off or whatever. And I squashed all my issues with them. And I came back here to upstate New York, to, to New York, knowing that I was going to do ayahuasca for the first time and let go of all of my issues with different people, as many people as I could. And totally prepared, you know, ate the right way to do ayahuasca, all this stuff. Went up there super clean and had a tremendous experience that I'll save for another time. But I've been on this really positive spiritual path and it's been great. And, you know, Carrie, you know, you know, you know, Carrie from me and Carrie doing a podcast. We've known each other for a while. Carrie's also from Brooklyn, She's from Canarsie, Brooklyn. And... Sometimes when, when, I met Car when I met Carrie, the first time I met Carrie was in 2004 at an art show. And I was like, I, was like, I like this motherfucker. He, he, he gets it. Like I say something to him and, and I, I see like sometimes the way he talks, yeah. it'll sound like something that I would say or something he'll say. It'll be like something that I say or whatever. It'd be like, like, like we fucking knew each other or something like yeah. that, you know? <laughs> and uh, I've always gotten along with Carrie, I think. I've always gotten along with him. Yeah. And I would tell, I've told, he's been around while I've been going through all this experience. And I told him, I'm like, some of these things I told him, hey, you know, I just did this thing. You should try it, you know, or whatever. And uh, one of the things I told him about was the 23andMe thing. And I said, oh, it's really interesting, you know, and he ended up doing that test as well. And, you know, figured out what he was going to figure out. And then... Later on, I told him about this stuff with the DMT and all that, and I had been trying to get him to do DMT. And he ended up saying yes to it. And then leading up to it, he ended up finding out some stuff as well. Wow. It's a good time to wrap up. Right? Yeah. Let's take a break. Can we take a break? Because he's about yeah. to tell his. Yeah, that's cool. Yep. There. Cool. That was a really amazing tale. <laughs> it, it is a good story? Yeah. How long was that? Holy shit. Very, very fast. Amazing. Well, let's make a podcast.